before we go to the fourth covenant proper, let us review. You know our knowledge of the unveiling of John chapter 4 verses 1 to 6? Yeah, of, of, of unveiling regarding how God set the pattern of our joy, our sanctuary on earth to our tabernacle in heaven that God has prepared for us. Why do we need to know these covenants? We know that when God created man, he intended this covenants only for his bride. So all of those who would be in covenant with God, whether you belong to the old covenant or the new covenant, definitely you are going to be a bride. What is this covenant? The covenant is a contract where a man has to be made one with God. The same way that in the physical, the marriage contract is a binding agreement between the man and a woman to be one flesh till death. So this covenant that we have with God is also binding in that we become one with God in spirit and in truth. And apart from us knowing the five Old Testament covenants, we will not have an idea. We will not have a clear idea how we will be able to meet the requirements of the new covenant. Okay, there are seven covenants because we know that the number seven is the number of completion and perfection which the bride has to go through. But there are five Old Testament covenants because you see that the focal point that makes us one with God in this binding contract is based on the cross. Because if you know, like before, when you have an oath or a vow or a contract that you make, you seal the contract with blood. Here also, it needed the shedding of the blood of Jesus, okay, for us to be able to seal that covenant. In the Old Testament covenant, because it is before the death of Jesus, the Trinity, they were the ones who fulfilled the requirements. Covenant. That's why there are five Old Testament covenants, so that we know that the number five is the number of grace. If you see their tabernacle, number one is the tabernacle of grace. This is why the five Old Testament covenants were able to transfer from the earthly sanctuary to the spiritual sanctuary, which is tabernacle number one, because they lived before the cross. And so it was the Trinity who fulfilled all the requirements of the covenant. That's why it's called monergistic. As in the New Testament, we came after the cross. So that if you will see in our diagram, if you look at sanctuary number three, for them, the five Old Testament covenants were only here in the upper part of the preparation of the sanctuary of God. For us in the New we now have the seven furnitures it include, because it now included both the altar of incense and the water uh, laver below. From the beginning of Genesis, the very first day of Genesis, when he says, let there be light, tabernacle number one already had light, but it will take time for man to be able to see the progressive unveiling of the completeness of this tabernacle. All we know is that there was light, but it did not have any furnitures. God put Adam in this tabernacle in the first heaven there. But after Adam sinned, Adam was brought to tabernacle number two, where you see uh, Adam was put to earth, which is now called the sanctuary of Satan. And apart from Adam being in covenant with God, we know where he would be destined to go to where we, he would be destined to go to the brazen altar below, which is the eternal lake of fire. So God, in his mercy, prepared all the five covenants. So the five covenants are God's way for man to be reconciled back with God. So for each generation, they belong to the particular covenant. And for us, it is very important that we know 
each and every covenant, even if it belonged to the old, because as we, if we review our past lesson, we know that for the first covenant, it is for us to be able to transfer to this first covenant where all of the brides should be ended up. We know that Adam had to be transferred to the spiritual seed. Adam had two seeds. The spiritual seed is called sons of God. And of course, Adam, after he sinned, belonged to the sons of man because he now belongs to tabernacle number two, the sanctuary of Satan, where Satan is now the ruler of Adam's heart. So with the new covenant, God showed that only the sons of God can transfer to tabernacle number one. So Adam always had two lineage. But we see that up to the time of Noah, in Genesis 6, after sons of man intermarried with the sons of God, there was only one family that stayed sons of God. So there God added another covenant, which is the second covenant. And what is that? It required that man has to enter the ark to be able to transfer to tabernacle number one. We know that that ark is there in the most holy place where God dwells, okay? And that ark is part of the whole tabernacle, which is tabernacle number one. Okay, so now we know too, to be able to transfer to tabernacle number one, we don't only have to belong to the seed of God, we have to be sons of God, we have to come inside the ark, okay? And then the next covenant would be the covenant with Abraham, which means where God showed Abraham, uh, the sign of Abraham's covenant was the covenant of circumcision. His was the circumcision of the flesh because Jesus has not yet died. It was before the cross. But for us, gives us a picture that for us to transfer to tabernacle number one, our hearts would have to be circumcised. And together with uh, the circumcision of the flesh of Abraham, he had three instructions. We know that uh, with those three instructions, God specified that you have to leave Egypt. You have to leave tabernacle number two. And then your heart will have to go through circumcision, meaning all the idols of the heart will have to uh, be expelled from your heart. That's the circumcision. And then... They also have to have the, the covenant of Adam, which means you have to belong to the sons of God. So now th those are the components of the three. So today we are going to go to the fourth covenant. Okay, we know that for all of the covenants, the key was to transfer from sanctuary number two to sanctuary number one. Let's read Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 to 12. What happened was the covenant with Abraham. Abraham was able to transfer to Canaan, supposedly the promised land, but it was just a place, okay? At that time, we did not yet know that it would be the heart. It was still the place, but he was able to obey God as God directed him. But Abraham was already in Canaan, but we see that in Canaan, there was a famine. So that by the time that Abraham died, all of his descendants were back to Egypt. So that now this is where covenant number four starts. We found all the chosen people still in Egypt. And there we see that God prepared a deliverer, a type of the human Jesus who would bring the chosen people out of Egypt. We know that we have to transfer from earth to the tabernacle number one. And we know that apart from God sending the type of the human Jesus, we cannot leave the earth. So God prepared Moses, a type of the human Jesus, to be able to bring the Israelites from Egypt to tabernacle number one, which is where the bride should end up. We are going to have added information in, in this fourth covenant because it's not only a matter of us transferring, it's a matter of obeying the law. We also see that we have to become priests and kings, okay? And we are going to see all of that in 
more detail in covenant number four. So what happened in Exodus number three, we find all the Israelites or the chosen people still in Egypt. And let's read in Exodus three, verse seven, on your own, you go ahead and read starting from verse one up to seven. So you'll get the complete picture. It's how God talked to Moses. You know, Moses was from Egypt. He brought him to the wilderness where God prepared Moses before he became God's chosen man to deliver the Israelites from Egypt, okay? And the Lord said, this is talking to Moses, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. From this we know that all of us, just like the chosen people, we are all here in Egypt. We are all here on earth. We see clearly that on earth, God calls us oppressed. Even if you enjoy all the pleasures of this world, we are still oppressed because what we do not know is that we are under bondage to Satan. Yes, you may enjoy some of the pleasures of this world, but with Satan, every good thing that you have, there is a price to pay. And so God saw the oppression of God's chosen people. And so he says, I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. So he says, so I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hebites and the Jebusites. What is this? Actually, he is talking about a land. All of our studies, we know that God is going to bring us to the land, meaning a heart, where all of these ice are the idols of our hearts that we acquired in Egypt. When we are in Egypt, we set up all different idols that gives us pleasure. This is what God calls the ice. So he says, I'm going to bring you from out of Egypt. And God knows that there's no way we can leave Egypt under bondage to Satan, apart from God sending the type of the human Jesus here it is Moses so that we will see it with our physical eyes. <laughs> because man is physical. That's why the, all of the Old Testament, God showed us so that we can see in the physical what is going to happen in the spiritual to us today who are now in the New Testament. Kasi tapos na yung physical representation of what God wanted to show us. Okay? And so he says, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. So you see, pag may paulit-ulit, that means it's very important. So it is just showing us that on earth, we are 100% oppressed. Okay? And so he says, come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh. Of course, here it's all figurative. It's all has symbolic. What it means is that when God says, I will send you to Pharaoh, meaning, Moses or Jesus is the only one who can fight Satan, the type of Pharaoh. So, so that he said, I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So it is only Jesus who can fight Satan, who can set us free from the bondage of Satan. Okay, this is in essence what is the spiritual counterpart or the meaning of these verses. And then in verse 11, it says, and Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Okay, verse 2 is very important. That's why I wanted to go back to Exodus 3. And God said, I will certainly be with you. And this is the sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. You know, this is true for Moses. It is true for Jesus. It is true for us who are the sons of God. That's why this is very important. And I want to focus on this and explain. What does it mean? For any messenger of God whom he is going to use to deliver his chosen people from out of Egypt or from earth, to bring them to God's tabernacle, to serve God on this mountain. This is mountain here is tabernacle number one. This is God's house. Okay. God is saying, you know, Moses, this is the sign that I am sending you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, he said, you will serve God on this mountain. In other words, a true man of God who is sent by God to deliver his people from out of Egypt, 100%, he should be able to bring them 
to tabernacle number one. This is in essence the meaning of this. That's the sign. The sign of a true messenger of God will be able to bring God's people out of Egypt so that they will all serve in tabernacle number one. Praise God. Now we, we have the picture of our journey where we know tabernacle number three is the preparation of the sanctuary, which is tabernacle number one. Tabernacle number 2A and 2B are where man dwells right now. We have to leave tabernacle number two or else we are destined to go to hell. We have to leave tabernacle number two to go to tabernacle number one. And the true messenger of God will lead us the way through the unveiling of the word so that we see clearly the step-by-step -step journey how for man to leave the earth. Because on our own effort, with our own human intellect, even if you read the Bible, we cannot leave Egypt. So now let's go to covenant number four. We read the beginning of God's assignment to Moses was to lead them out of Egypt. And so in Exodus 19, verses 3 to 6, this is very important, very, very beautiful because it says, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. So see, we know here clearly that Moses is sent by God. Why? Because Moses is already talking to God in the mountain. So where is that? Moses is talking to God where? It's already in God's tabernacle of light. Because we see the, the life of Moses. He came from Egypt. And then he went to the wilderness. That's where God prepared him for 40 years. And then he was now ready. To, he heard God in the brazen altar. Where's the brazen altar? That was the burning bush. That's in Exodus 3. If you read earlier, you know, God called him from the burning bush. Where was that? That's already here in the entrance of the um, mountain of God here in tabernacle number one. Okay, so it says, and then what did God say to Moses? Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and to tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine. When we read this, it just sounded beautiful. Para lang ang sabi natin, wow, ang sarap naman. God carried them on eagle's wings. Now, as we are going to dissect this verse, we are going to see how God carried the Israelites on eagle's wings. This was forward looking to the cross. We are going to find out later that the Israelites, there's no way they could leave Egypt. Because everyone who is in Egypt is in sin. And we do not have the freedom to get out of Egypt because when you are in sin, you are bound to Satan. Okay? So since they had no way of having their sins cleansed, God forward looking to crucifixion. We are going to see it's the Trinity working together. So that God transported them in eagle's wings. Ano pinapakita lang sa atin yung picture sa physical na literal silang kinarga ni God sa eagle's wings. Kasi kung hindi, hindi sila makakaalis sa Egypt dahil papatayin sila ni Pharaoh. But this was forward looking to the cross. That God fulfilled all the requirements of the cross. That's why they were able to cross over to the wilderness. We are going to see all of that in picture language in a few moments. I'm just giving you an idea what Exodus 19 verses 3 to 5 means. In verse 6, sabi niya, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Now, we will not be able to understand this without going through Exodus 40. We know that all of them had to fulfill the Commandments of God, which God laid down in Exodus 20, verses 1 to 17. And that's where the Ten Commandments are written, okay? And then in Exodus 24, verses 1 to 12, let's read. And then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain. Well, again, you know, we know that he's sent by God because every time he talks to God, it's in the mountain. You have to remember, a messenger of God, definitely he has to have been already there. 
enter God's tabernacle or to be a true messenger of God. He says, and there I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments, which I have written that you may teach them. Exodus 24 was where God gave them the tablets of stone. And then in Exodus 32, verse 19, you see, it did not take a long time. You know, when Moses was gone talking to God for 40 days and 40 nights, look at this, it says, so it was as soon as he came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot and he cast the tablets out of his hands and he broke them at the foot of the mountain. We all know that Jesus broke the first set of the Ten Commandments. What? is the spiritual perspective. What is the counterpart of this? The counterpart of the breaking of those Ten Commandments, like I told you, Exodus 19 is a picture of the cross. This is a picture of Jesus putting an end to the law by dying on the cross. Because God knew that there is no way that the Israelites will be able to obey the law. So makita natin, sandali lang si Moses na wala. Hindi, pag hindi na nila nakikita si God, what happened? They already were worshiping idols. So Jesus broke the first set of Ten Commandments. What is this a picture of? Like I said, at first, this is a picture of Jesus on the cross. By putting an end to the law, his heart was pierced. So that when his heart was pierced, his body will go to the ground he will be the one to pay for the penalty of our sins. That's why he broke those tablets because it is saying you will not be able to obey those. So I'm going to put an end to the law so that you can now transfer to grace. So in the Old Testament, in this fourth covenant, Jesus fulfilled the law forward looking. Okay, this was forward looking. Sa atin iba, sa atin synergistic na. Kaya sa atin, we have to join Jesus in his death dito sa altar of incense. Sa at, well, I will teach that when we go to the new covenant. Kikita natin dito sa preparation of the sanctuary, Moses' covenant was here in the brazen altar. That's why it was before the cross. So when Moses broke the Ten Commandments, you see now a picture of the cross forward looking to the cross. It means Jesus will have to die. His heart will have to be pierced so that the sins of the Israelites will be forgiven, so God could be able to carry them on eagle's wings. That's why God could carry them on eagle's wings. And you know what? It's not only the work of Jesus. That's why what we are going to find out is that carrying the chosen people on eagle's wings needed the finger, the hand, and the arm of God. That's what we are going to find out next. Okay, now let me read Deuteronomy 7, 9 verse 7. It says, And then I took the two tablets and threw them out of my two hands and broke them before your eyes. Now we know the meaning of that. Counterpart to them, and counterpart to it all was um, Jesus putting an end to the law by forward looking to his death. For us now, for our journey today in the New Testament, this is parallel to the demolition of our hearts. Meaning, Jesus' heart was pierced so that his blood would fall to the ground and, and then his body will be buried in the ground and will pay for the sins of the Israelites then. Sa atin naman ngayon, it's the demolition of the heart. When Jesus' heart was pierced, our hearts will have to be pierced so that all of our sins will now fall to the ground and join Jesus in this altar of incense. So you see, you see a picture of how it was in the fourth covenant and how it is to us in the new covenant. That's the picture of the breaking of the tablets, which man cannot obey. So God put an end to that law for them in the Old Testament, for them in the fourth covenant, for them to be transferred to tabernacle number one, because they had to be transferred to grace. When that put an end to the law, to transfer to grace. Before we go to Exodus 40, we come across Exodus 25 so that we will know how God would prepare the sanctuary. You know, Exodus 25 is not only for them, but it's also for us. We know that that sanctuary or the tabernacle is a picture of our hearts. Tabernacle number one is the picture of the heart of the bride that's ready, ready now for rapture, 
so that we will be ready for our wedding, okay? Exodus 25 verses 1 to 8 is a picture that God is telling us that for God to be able to build his tabernacle in our hearts, we have a part. We know that we have to give willingly from our hearts everything <laughs> that my heart loves. You know, you have to lay down everything. Verse 6, this is an uh, added information that we are learning when it says oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil. We are going to learn more about this when we go to Exodus 40. See, all of this will have to come from the children of Israel. All these materials will have to come from the children of Israel so that God could build a physical house. Actually, in the Old Testament, it was just a physical house that we can see with our physical eyes. But God was showing us a picture that all of the materials for building this Exodus 40 tabernacle in the wilderness, the materials came from the people, okay? And it says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So if you did not lay down your heart and give all of these materials, God cannot build his sanctuary in your heart. Now, before we go to Exodus 40, you take a look at sanctuary number three. What we see here that God was the one who gave us specific instructions as to the furniture. Here we see that the preparation of the sanctuary is God going down because God is in the third heaven. It's above the tabernacle, number one. God's dwelling place is still above that, okay? So for God to be able to even dwell with man and for man to dwell with God, God had to prepare his sanctuary on earth. Meaning, kailangan meron siyang bahay dito sa earth na titirhan bago niya tayo iaakyat doon kung saan siya nakatira. Kailangan meron muna siyang bahay dito na makakasama natin. That's the preparation of the heart of the bride. Okay? So God showed us in sanctuary number three, in Exodus 25, how God would prepare tabernacle number one. For God to do that, God had to come down because there's no way man can go up. So it is God who came down. We see here that from this diagram, Jesus was going to go through two deaths. The first death was here on the cross in the brazen altar above. Tabernacle of light. Why? Because Jesus had a spiritual heart. So he had to die spiritually here in tabernacle number three in the brazen altar above okay in tabernacle of light that's light and then he had to die a second death in the altar of incense below that's below the earth he had to die in the flesh that is where his body was burned together with our sins jesus had to die two deaths so that his bride will just have to die one death those who did not leave the earth will have to die two deaths. For us who are born again, we're only going to die once. We're not ever going to die again. Because it is Jesus who took our two deaths. Kaya nga nakikita mo, yung altar of incense is here below. Because Jesus was going down first. His first death was here in the brazen altar. Okay, He died in the spirit. He had to die in the spirit. So that he will give us his spirit when we now enter tabernacle number one. So that is why the altar of incense is here below. And we see that water labor is below because for us to be able to go to tabernacle number one, we have to go through two judgments. The judgment of water and the judgment of fire. Our judgment of water and judgment of fire that was in hell, it was the trinity that took that. That's why the water labor is down here below. And of course, that's the water and the blood that flowed from the side of Jesus. So that's why the first death of Jesus was on the cross right there. It's on top there. It was there where his heart was pierced. So yung tugulang niya at saka yung tubig at dugo ang bumaba dito sa ground. So yun ang unang judgment na tinake ng Trinity in our place. So that now we will be set free to go to tabernacle number one. So that's the preparation of the sanctuary. Why is it set up like this? Because Jesus had to die two deaths. Yung isa sa labas ng light, yung isa sa loob 
Why was this so? Because Jesus had a spiritual heart. He had a spiritual spirit. He had to surrender it here on the brazen altar to give to us as the exchange. Okay, let's go now to Exodus 40. I showed you the preparation of the sanctuary so that you will see the difference between that preparation and the sanctuary. We are now going to go through the explanation of the sanctuary in the wilderness. Why is the um, uh, sanctuary in the wilderness very important for us to understand? It's very important for us to understand because the sanctuary in the wilderness is the pattern that God showed us so that we will understand our journey going up to tabernacle number one. Theirs was before the cross, but God already showed us the pattern. Remember in Exodus 25 verse 8, sabi niya, you have to build me a sanctuary that I may dwell with you. Okay, in the Old Testament, God was dwelling with them, external dwelling ni God sa kanila. You just read Exodus 40 verses 1 to 8. It's just telling you each furniture as God says it, and then he will set it up. They appeared in the same order as when Jesus went down. There you go. Did you see that? If you read that, that's how they appeared. So the only important part that for us to know there that God showed us the way this is set up is the same picture of the true tabernacle in heaven, in tabernacle number one. It's now the same picture. Magkaiba lang siya yung Jesus going down. Okay? Kasi makikita mo dito yung water laver na dito na sa um, in between the brazen altar and, and the curtain. So um, this is now a picture of tabernacle number one except the ceremonies that they do here is just a ritual that would just temporarily cover their sins, but it did not yet erase their sins. It just temporarily covered it so that the destroyer will not put them to death. Let's go to verse 9. And you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it. And you shall hallow it and all its utensils. It shall be holy. This verse is very important. If you just read it and you do not know the unveiling of this verse, it's just a narrative. But when the Holy Spirit now anoints you and opens this verse to you, you will know that when God says you have to anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and all its utensils, it shall be holy, meaning the tabernacle number one is an anointed place so that everything there is holy, even the utensils, meaning all that God is going to use or God is going to allow to get in the tabernacle that's going to touch the tabernacle has to be holy. How is this possible? Because of the anointing oil. If you don't have any idea what is this anointing oil, you will not know how holiness in the tabernacle number one came about. It says that you shall anoint the altar of the burnt offering and its utensils and consecrate the altar. Consecrate means setting apart for holiness. Okay? Consecrate the altar and the altar shall be most holy. You know the burnt altar there in the tabernacle number one is very important because that's the first furniture where Jesus would burn. You remember in the preparation of the sanctuary where the cross was? That is most holy because that is where Jesus first died so that we will be made holy so that the forgiveness of our sins will come about. Otherwise, <laughs> our sins will never be forgiven. And it says, you shall anoint the labor and its base and consecrate it. All of these words will become clear as we move forward. Okay, now let us have an understanding, the unveiling of what it means to be anointed by this oil. In Exodus 30, verses 22 to 30, God describes how to produce this oil. And it will give us an idea. I will let you just read that by yourself. And I just want to show you that for you to uh, be able to produce this oil, it takes a lot of pounding, it takes a lot of tribulation, it takes a lot of affliction, it takes burning, you know. Um, in other words, you are going to go through the grinder 
to be able to produce that oil. And it has to meet exactly the instructions, the exact instructions of God, pati yung measurements. They have to come from special spices, you know, like this uh, cane, calamus, the, the myrrh, the sweet smelling cinnamon, and then even the measurements, you know, like 500 shekels, five, you know, is grace, and then, you know, lahat yan. You know, like ito palang myrrh, you know how myrrh is produced? It comes from the bark. You know, you have to wound a tree that is on top of a mountain. You have to wound a tree on the darkest night. And when and the sap comes out, after it dries up, it produces a resin. You see the resin here beside the myrrh? And then you have to grind that. I don't know what else you have to do until it becomes liquid. And it is very expensive. Why? You see, this is a myrrh tree. You see, below is the myrrh tree where you see the light. It is full of thorns. So for you to even wound this tree, to be able to extract the resin, you will go through these thorns. And myrrh is the incense they use, the perfume put in the coffin to embalm the dead people. So that, I guess it was for them to have a sweet smelling fragrance. And all of this combination you cannot use for just anything. It should only be used for the anointing of the tabernacle. What is the tabernacle? It's our hearts. Meaning our hearts have to be made holy because our hearts have to be anointed with this oil. How can it be anointed? It has to go through all of this grinding, pressing. It has to go through the deepest night. Your heart will be wounded in the deepest night and then the sap will have to be dried. It has to be grounded, salted, and then burned. And then what I want for you to take notice is this olive oil. Other than the anointing of the tabernacle, who would be anointed? The one who would be anointed next would be Aaron and his sons. Aaron was the type of the human Jesus who was first anointed with oil, and it says in verse 30, and you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister to me. Ayan, this is how we become priests. First, the one who was anointed was Aaron, type of Jesus who is our high priest, and then his sons. We are now the firstborn sons of God. Okay, we too have to be consecrated just like Aaron so that we can minister to God as priests so that we can enter. The, the only, you have to know that in the Old Testament, only the Levites were the only ones who can enter the tabernacle of God. It's giving us a picture that when you and I are anointed with this oil, that is how we become sons of God and how our hearts will become holy. We have to go through the journey of the seven, seven, sevens that we are learning. Okay? Yung pattern na pinapakita sa atin, yun ang ating dadaanan. So the road is not easy. And so now let's go to the first glimpse of what anointing oil, of how Jesus was anointed with oil. Jesus, before his death, we find him in the Garden of Gethsemane. The meaning of Gethsemane is oil press. For God to show us that before his son was crucified, he had to be anointed with oil by God himself. So Jesus was anointed by God himself in the garden. That's why it's not an accident pala that Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane because in the Garden of Gethsemane is called the oil press. It's full of olive trees where God is giving us a picture that to extract the oil from the olives, it is the heaviest press that you use. You know, wine press, hindi masyadong mabigat lalabas yung wine. But to go through the oil press, it is a heavy stone that you have to press the olives to be able to squeeze the oil. Just to show you how hard uh, Jesus had to go through this anointing of oil, he had to sweat blood. We, we can see the picture of how painful and how difficult 
that oil press that Jesus had to go through, through the cross, okay? So Jesus was the very first one to be anointed. Yung kay Aaron, forward-looking picture to when Jesus would finally be the one to be the anointed of God to truly anoint our hearts so that our hearts will be made holy. So now from Exodus 40, you will see how we become priests. We have to be anointed by this oil. Okay? Through our, <laughs> through our journey. And this is even different from the incense. Iba pa yung oil, iba pa yung incense. Incense is another thing. I think I've already, I already went through the incense with you, where Onika, Galbanum, and all of those. It's also, it's also going through all tribulations and a picture of all tribulations and pain that the heart will have to go through to be ready for it to be anointed by God. In other words, hindi po pwedeng may natitirang ni isang ayota ng physical heart. In other words, kailangan gigilingin, dudurugin, walang matitirang original puso. Kailangan bagong puso ang pwedeng tirhan ni God. That's just the picture that, you know, it is showing us. In Exodus 13 verses 1 to 3, we see a picture how Jesus was not only the first one who was anointed, Jesus was the first one to be consecrated. In Exodus 13 verses 1 to 3, it says, And then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast. It is mine. What is this talking about? It's talking about forward-looking to the only one person in the whole world who would open the womb of a woman. All of us, the sons of men, we did not open the womb of our mothers. It's the husbands who opened the womb. But with Jesus, because Mary was the only virgin who gave birth, Jesus was the only one person born in the world that opened the womb of a woman. And God says, whoever will open the womb of the woman, consecrate it to me because he is mine. And at the same time, all of the firstborn of the beast were also gods. They were also supposed to be consecrated because in the Old Testament, it is those clean animals, they will be the ones to redeem God's firstborn. But on top of that, I don't know now where it was. I think we'll come across it somewhere. It will say that the firstborn of man you shall redeem. But the um, consecrated animals you don't redeem. It's the unclean animals that you redeem. But the holy, they were supposed to be clean animals. They were supposed to be the one to redeem the firstborn of God. That is in the Old Testament. For us today, wow. It is Jesus himself who was consecrated to redeem us. That's why, remember, in the Old Testament, we already knew this. Consecrate, remember, means commemorate. Consecrate, commemorate, celebrate. And then it says, And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by the strength of hand, the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Now we understand. Why were they able to leave Egypt? Because they now ate unleavened bread. They ate unleavened bread because God says, you have to remember this day. Because when the animal, the first lamb that was slain on Passover night, it is a picture forward looking to the true fulfillment of Passover of Jesus on the cross. So that the next day they had to remember. Remember before they left Egypt, they only had unleavened bread with them. What does that mean? That means they were now cleansed from sin. That's why they were able to leave Egypt. That's why God was able to carry them on eagle's wings. Because Jesus already was consecrated, forward-looking to his death, would forgive their sins. And then the Holy Spirit would now wash their sins. That is the unleavened bread that they ate as on they departed from Egypt. For us today, when we have communion, that's why when we have communion, we say, Today, we, you remember, you remember um, when we go through communion, it is a commemoration of Jesus' death. What does that mean? 
it is not only a ritual that we celebrate when we receive communion, but it means we are consecrated and we remember. Meaning, we are consecrated, meaning we are anointed. All of my flesh is dead in communion. So I can now commune. I can be one with Jesus because I had been anointed because I had been through the grind. I endured all the dying of my human heart because I was able to commemorate. What does commemorate mean? I was able to join the death of Jesus on the cross. Before then, they only had to remember. But for us, it is commemorate. Our remembering of the cross is not only remembering, but joining him. So that now for us, the day of Passover is now in the tabernacle number one, where when we get to the brazen altar, we can now celebrate Passover. So yun ang difference ng consecrate, commemorate is remember, for us, our appointment with God is our festivals. That's why we now go through seven festivals in tabernacle number one, where our first festival is in the brazen altar, where we can now celebrate because we are joining Jesus in the burning of my heart in the brazen altar together with Jesus. Because after Jesus was burned here in the brazen altar in the preparation of the sanctuary, he was risen because his heart his spiritual heart could never die. He will wait for me in the brazen altar in tabernacle number one. So that while my heart is burning there, Jesus is with me. That is the meaning of communion. Okay? It is the celebration of our Passover with God. So this is why it is very important for us to know the Old Testament covenants because to be able to join Jesus in the new, we have to understand, we still have to have all these components. The new seed, we have to enter the ark, we have to be circumcised in the heart, we have to come to the end of the law when our hearts are pierced, just like the two tablets were broken, our hearts will have to be broken. In Luke 2 verse 22 to 23, this is now the fulfillment of that Exodus 13 where he says, consecrate to me all of the firstborn who opened the womb. Of course, from that time, Exodus 13, up to the time that Jesus was born, there was no one, no, no human being opened the womb. It would only be in Luke after Jesus was born on the eighth day is the day of purification. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, what happened? They brought Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Now, this was the law in Exodus 13, verses 1 to 3. It says, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. For us to be made holy, the sacrifice that has to be sacrificed on the cross has to be one who is holy. From the beginning of time, there's no one who's ever holy. Holy means never sinned. That is why the Son of God has to come down. He is the only holy one of God who has not committed any sin. And he is the only one who opened the womb, who was consecrated so that when he was consecrated, meaning when he was anointed to die, he is the only one who can make us holy. When we join him in communion, join him in death on the cross. <laughs> so hindi po pwede yung tanggapin mo na lang si Lord, born again ka na. How is that possible? How is that possible? Cannot be. You, we have to be anointed. You see in Exodus 40, God is giving us a picture how to build just the physical tabernacle. Today, God is building the spiritual tabernacle, which is tabernacle number one. Where are we anointed? We are anointed there in the brazen altar, in the first furniture, in tabernacle number one. That is where we start to be made holy. Kasi susunugin na dyan yung lumang puso ko eh. Okay? Napatawad na dito sa tabernacle number three sa baba. Nalinisan na yung sing, nabayaran na, nahugasan na. Pero yung puso ko, na nalinisan na, kailangan pa sunugin. Then, I am made holy. That's why the next is the unleavened bread. Wala na akong sin. 
wala na akong sin and never to sin again. In tabernacle number one. I'm just showing you a picture. So look to look to 22 to 23 is the fulfillment of Exodus 13 verses 1 to 3. So see how the Bible is also interconnected? Exodus 40. Let's continue reading. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and wash them with water. So you see, it's only after their anointing that you can now bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. You have to remember that a while ago, when God was just giving us the covenants, this tabernacle number one was closed. Nobody can get in. Only the consecration of the Holy One who was born of a woman born who opened the womb. He was going to be the one to open that gate in tabernacle number one. Kaya nga for them, for the Israelites in Egypt, they were brought to the wilderness on eagle's wings because they cannot yet go inside the door because the door in tabernacle number one was closed. That is why God in his love carried them on eagle's wings. Yung pala yung meaning ng eagle swings na yun. Sabi ko, Lord, ang lalim pala nun. Akala mo lang, imagine, wow, sarap naman. <laughs> carry the eagle swing. It needed the crucifixion pala for God to be able to carry them on eagle swings. Because why? The door to the tabernacle number one is still closed. It is only when Jesus was sacrificed that that is when that gate was open for you and I now to gain our entry to that gate when you join Jesus in death, in the altar of incense below. Okay? So it says, You shall put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him that he may minister to me as priest. And you shall bring his sons and clothe them in the tunics. Dito pala galing. Dati alam na natin itong tunic na to, kay Joseph. Um, and Jacob made the coat of many colors. He gave to Joseph yun yung tunic. Nalaman na natin yung tunic. That is our coverings. We will not be burned when we go to the when we are going to be burned in the brazen altar. This is where we get the tunic. This is how we get the tunic in the new covenant. God showed us a picture. How are you gonna get the tunic when you get consecrated and when when you get anointed and become priest so that you can now enter to the gate to the door that is open in tabernacle number one. Verse 15, you shall anoint them as you anointed their father. See, just as Jesus was anointed, we have to be anointed. Ngayon, naintindihan na natin yung oil na yun eh. Dati, hindi ba natin naintindihan? Ano ba ito? How to be anointed with oil? Kasi hindi yun natin pinag-aralan yung Exodus 30 kung saan binigay. Imagine, God gave specific instructions on how that oil was to be produced. And so it says, that they may minister to me as priests, for their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Ngayon, we already understand because of Exodus 40, we now we understand how to become priests. Before that, before this, you never knew how am I going to become a priest? You cannot become a priest unless you are consecrated, unless you consecrate, unless you commemorate, and unless you are anointed. Very, very, very important. Oh, okay, this is beautiful. In Numbers 3, verses 11 to 13, God says, And then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now behold, look at this. I myself have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the children of Israel. So, syempre, wala pa si Jesus. So, syempre, wala pang nag-open ng womb. So, what did God do? God chose the Levites. Sino yung Levites? Lahat ng descendants. They are 12 tribes, right? So, he appointed one tribe. Tribe ni Moses and Aaron and all of his sons. They were called Levites. So God appointed them to be his, sabi niya. They will take the place of the firstborn who opens the womb. So until Jesus came, God chose a line to be priests so that they will be the one to enter the tabernacle of God. Sabi niya, therefore, the Levites shall be mine. But we know that when Jesus came, he was not from the tribe of Levi, but he was from the tribe of Judah. So it is now a new priesthood. We are going to take this up when I teach the new covenant with you. That's very beautiful too. And because all the firstborn are mine. So look, 
Ki Lord, walang second born. If you are the sons of God, we are all first born. Kaya nga makikita mo yung genealogy ni Jesus, dalawa yung genealogy niya, one from Adam and one from Abraham, naintindihan na natin na yung kung bakit. <laughs> Kasi dyan sa covenants na bago, natapos kay Moses, namatay lahat. So nagumpisa kay Abraham, nag-start siya ng new seed na mas clear yung, yung sons of God doon, nang galing sa seed ni Isaac. So makikita mo sino yung uh, bigat, bigat, bigat. Kay Jesus nag-stop na. Because from Jesus, we now become the firstborn of God. All of us are firstborn of God. All the bride becomes God's firstborn. Kaya nga sabi niya, Therefore, the Levites shall be mine because all the firstborn are mine. Look at this. On the day that I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. So what happened when the Israelites, when the chosen people left Egypt? What happened? All the firstborn of Pharaoh's tabernacle, they all died. God is showing us a picture. What picture is God showing us? By my leaving Egypt, I am now sanctified as God's firstborn. My counterpart in Egypt, they all died. So it's a picture of my old heart dying in Egypt. Because I left Egypt, I am now God's firstborn. It's just a, That's just a picture. It's God showing us a physical para makikita natin kailangan mamatay yung ating old heart sa Egypt so that I can be God's firstborn when I go through the wilderness. Ang wilderness nila noon is equivalent to our first brace and altar sa tabernacle number one. That's a beautiful picture there. So ngayon maintindihan mo na why all the firstborn of Egypt died. Because it was God sanctifying to himself all the firstborn of Israel. Beautiful picture. Look at all the all the dead firstborn in Egypt. Yan, hindi yan umalis ng Egypt. Pinauulit ko lang ito para makikita natin na sa kanila noon, ano lang, it was just a ritual. Hindi mo yan maintindihan. Pero sa atin ngayon, pinauulit ko para ma- ma- connect natin ngayon sa atin. You know, that was old for them in the Old Testament. It is still true to us today when you see the unveiling of scriptures. This is how we should now understand the meaning of communion. Communion means we become one with God. When we eat the bread, we are consecrated. And we drink the wine, we are anointed to be God's firstborn. Because we are now unleavened. When we drink that wine, we become unleavened bread. In our hearts is now running the blood of God. Wow, this is beautiful. This is how they were carried on eagle's wings. Okay, in Exodus 40 verses 34 to 38, the fourth covenant was before the crucifixion of Jesus so that God cannot yet indwell their hearts. But God, because of his mercy and grace, he never left the Israelites from day one that they left Egypt. What happened was he was still with them but he was in the form of the pillar of clouds and the pillar of fire. Let's look. Having a verse 34, let's read. When the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Okay, God is still showing that where would God be? Only in his tabernacle, okay? The tabernacle of God then was still external to the people. But you see, wherever they went, the tabernacle was always in the middle. You see the construction where the tents was, 12 tribes, Equally divided yan. Tribes sa north, tribes sa south, east, etc. And the tabernacle was in the middle. God is showing us a picture that God's tabernacle is right smack in the middle of our hearts. <laughs> and this is God's dwelling place. Okay? Verse 35, it says there, And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onwards in all their journey. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. What is this showing us? That even then, when God was still external to them, when God could still go inside their hearts, they only move as the Spirit moves. Because we know that the clouds is the waters above and that's the Holy Spirit. Imagine the clouds are supposed to be up in the sky. It went down just to be with them. 
So that's the representative of the Holy Spirit being above them. So that when the clouds or the spirit move, they move. When the clouds would stay, they stay. It doesn't make any difference how long it will stay. They will not move unless the spirit moves. It's a picture for us today. When we are now in God's tabernacle number one, we are now supposed to be led by the spirit of God so that it's no longer me planning my day, what to do, etc., where to go to minister or whatever. I only move as the spirit leads me to move. I only talk as the Spirit leads my mouth to talk. So that's why I can no longer sin if I am led by the Spirit in all things, in my thoughts, in my words, in my actions, in everything that I do. That's how we are supposed to be when we are rapture ready. And look at this, verse 38, For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and the fire was over it by night. We know that the fires above is Jesus. So that even then when they were joining in the wilderness, God's presence never left them. At night when it was dark, they still had the light because the pillar of fire was there in their midst, which was in the tabernacle of God. So God is showing us that when we now belong to tabernacle number one, God's light is in our hearts. We will never walk in darkness, whether it be night or day. We are in the light. Covenant number four is parallel to day four of creation. Remember, covenant one was parallel to day one. Covenant two was parallel to day two. Covenant three was parallel to day three. Now we are going to see that day four of creation is parallel to covenant number four. Genesis 1 verses 14 to 19 is the day four of the seven days of creation. And then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide day from the night. Now we have a better understanding because as we keep going back to scripture, the light that God gives us in our understanding or unveiling becomes progressive then. So ngayon mas naintindihan na natin ito. Ang ginawa lang pala niya sa fourth day, yung lights. Okay, before in the past, we thought that the lights God made was the sun, the moon, and the stars. Eh, hindi pala kasama yung moon because the moon does not have a light. And besides, the moon is a planet pala that just revolves. So God did not make that on the fourth day. But let's continue reading, sabi niya. Let the lights be in the firmament of the heavens. What is this showing us? That the firmament of the heavens is plural. So God was going to put light in the firmament of the heavens, which is plural. Meaning, the firmament of the heavens is that where the light is. Ayan, nakikita mo. Tabernacle of God, yung firmament. May firmament din. May first heaven, yung tabernacle number one. May first heaven. And then the firmament of the earth. Also, the earth also has a firmament. And that's the sky. So God was going to put lights in both the firmament of the heavens, which is in the light, and he was going to put lights in the firmament of the earth. Okay, so understood the first verse. To divide the day from the night. Okay, makikita mo always ang demarcation, ang night, ang earth, ang light, yung heaven. Tabernacle number one. Okay? And this is all on earth, okay? Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Ngayon, nabuksan na yung ating understanding. Dahil sa four covenants, we know that all four, all four covenants had signs. Okay? Now, we know that when we encounter signs, everything that is physical has a spiritual counterpart. And then verse 15. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. All the lights that God would put, you know, whether it's in heaven or on earth, they will give light on the earth. Iilawan ang earth. Verse 16. And then God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. What is the greater light? What was the greater light? The greater light was the light in the tabernacle of the kingdom of light. And who is the light there? It's the Trinity. It's the Trinity that gives light in the tabernacle of light. That is the greater light. They were also the greater light in the wilderness. But they were in the form of the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. So even the Old Testament, even us in the New Testament, our greater light is still the Trinity. Both in the Old and the New. 
in the new, it's in the tabernacle of light. In the old, it was the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. And then the lesser light to rule the night. Ano yung night? All of the earth is considered darkness and night. What were the lesser lights that God put? The lesser light that God put was all the light bearers who had the, the tabernacle number one in their hearts. These light bearers are the only lights, spiritual lights that the earth can see. They are the only ones that can give light to the people who are still in darkness on earth. Everyone on earth is still in darkness apart from those who have the tabernacle number one in their hearts. They were the lesser lights. And then in the physical, God says, and he made the stars also. God made two great lights. The greater light, tapos na natin. And to rule the day. See, for all of us who are of the day, who rules us? The Trinity is the one who rules us. Why? Because the Trinity is now indwelling in our hearts, ruling us, guiding us in everything that we do. Okay? Siya na yung ating God. Hindi na yung God ng night who is Satan kasi umalis na tayo ng Egypt. And then the lesser light to rule the night, yung light bearers pala yun. And then he said, he made the stars also. Now we see in the physical, in the firmament of the sky on earth, he made the stars. Dito ko naintindihan na yung palang sun is only a star. So when he said he made the stars also, kasama na doon yung sun, kasama na yung physical stars. Okay? The sun is the most important star. It's not the biggest. There are stars that are bigger than the sun. But the sun is the most important because it is the hottest and it is because of the sun that there is life in the physical earth. You know, man, dito naman sa of the day na light bearers, yung life natin at saka yung light natin, yun ang trinity. Okay? Why did the light bearers rule the night? Okay? Because in Genesis 1 verse 28, we saw that when God first created Adam before he sinned, it says here, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So what is this a picture of? Before Adam sinned, Adam had dominion over all the physical universe, meaning physical animals, the animals, the birds, the fishes, everything, okay? But when you and I now enter God's tabernacle and are reconciled with God, a God brings back the dominion not only of the physical, God brings back the dominion over everything, including all of the night, including all of the darkness. That's why we are the ruler of the night. We rule the day because we have dominion over darkness. Satan is the ruler of the world. Do lang sa those who are in darkness. But tayo must be bigger authority because now in Mark 16 verses 17 to 18, ano sabi niya? When you understand the sign, ano sabi niya? And this sign shall follow those who believe. In my name, they shall cast out demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. What does this mean? They will cast out demons. Ano yun? We now have authority and power over Satan and all his cohorts. Dominion over the birds, over the lions, over the serpents, over everything. Tayo, yung dominion natin over the uh, uh, birds. Ano yung birds? Satan's cohorts in the heavenly places. We have dominion over the fish because magnagaling sa sea, nandoon yung galing yung Antichrist, si Satan, all of the others who are going to go through judgment. We have dominion over all of darkness, in other words. That is what... <laughs> that is what the light bearer has. Dominion, bumalik yung dominion ni Adam, but this time, it's over all of darkness as well. Okay, let's go to um, Hebrews 10, 11 to 22. And every priest st stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. 
Um, what I want to explain to you now is how we have the dominion. Kaya nga pala, we have the dominion over all of darkness. We, we can now be ruler of the light because of this sacrifice that Jesus made. Look, in verse 12, sabi niya, in the Old Testament, every day, they have to keep repeating the sacrifices just so, you know, they have the covering for sin. But in verse 12, sabi niya, this man, meaning Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, and from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. That's why, where does our sanctification start? It starts when we enter tabernacle number one. Can you imagine when you are there in tabernacle number one, that is where you now have dominion. You regain the dominion that Adam lost except more. It says, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us that after he had said before, look at this, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds. I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. I have that in red. Now where there is remission of this, there is no longer an offering for sin. Look at this. When our sins and lawless deeds are completely erased, Satan no longer has dominion over us. That's why we have been set free. That is what Jesus has done for us. Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father, where through that one sacrifice, my goodness, he had made us his sons when we entered that door in tabernacle number one until we go through those seven ladders, seven steps, and we meet God in the most holy place in the Ark of the Covenant. So now we go to Exodus 19, verses 3 to 4. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord, this is the monergistic fulfillment. We already read that a while ago. That is when God carried us on eagle's wings. That's the monergistic fulfillment of the first covenant. Yung palang when God carried us on eagle's wings. Monergistic meaning we did not go through the demolition of the heart. God was external carrying us on eagle's wings. Yung pala yung monergistic kasi di, sila lahat ang nag-fulfill ng lahat ng requirements ng law. So ngayon naintindihan na natin yung meaning ng monergistic. Ang ganda ng meaning pala nung being carried on eagle's wings. Tapos itong Exodus 32 verses 12, sabi niya, So it was soon as he came near the camp that he that he saw the calf and the, and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot and he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Now we see Yung, yung palang Exodus 19 verses 3 to 4, nakatago doon yung finger, yung hand, at saka yung arm ni God. It shows that very clearly sa picture. Ang finger ni God, yun yung law. Yung law. Okay? What, ano yung finger? Ang finger, ang, ang, kasi makikita mo muna, yung finger, yun ang judgment ni God kay Jesus kasi si Jesus yung nag-fulfill ng law. How was he able to fulfill it? Kailangan siya yung namatay. Ang pagsulat nung Ten Covenants doon sa Tablets of Stone, si Jesus yung nag-fulfill noon through the judgment, through the judgment. So yung finger, judgment ni God kay Jesus. Kaya siya ang nag-fulfill ng law for us. Yung hand, yun yung Holy Spirit na nagbinasag, binasag yung, yung tablets. Hand ni God ang nagbaksak sa lupa, so yung Holy Spirit yun. And then, putting an end to the law, that's the arm of God. So nakita mo doon, yung una, judgment ng Trinity. Nung pagbas, yung binasag yung ten tablets, makikita mo doon nakatago yung hand, yung arm, yung finger, the hand, and the arm of God. Yun yung unang judgment. Because before restoration, judgment has to take place. So it is the Trinity who took the judgment for them. Do the monergistic. Judgment was the breaking of the tablets as the flesh of Jesus that was torn. And then 
the restoration is carrying the Israelites on eagles' wings in the wilderness. So the Trinity fulfilled the requirements of the cross in the Old Testament. Ganyan na fulfilled yung Exodus 19 verses 3 to 4. We see the picture of the finger, the hand, and the arm. Okay, in Exodus 31 verse 18 it says, And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony of stone written with the finger of God. Yun pala yung finger of God. Una, pinapakita lang dito in, in, in details, okay? And then in Exodus 8 verse 9, when the Israelites were still in Egypt, going through the ten plagues, after the third plague, makita mo, ang magician kasi they're considered wise. Yung parang sa atin ngayon, yung may unveiling. Imagine, after the third plague, ang Exodus 8 verse 19, ano sabi? The magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had said. So in other words, yung magicians, nakita nila na finger ni God yun. So ano yung pinapakita doon? The judgment of God was on the Egyptians, pero yung judgment ni God para sa atin, napunta sa Trinity, napunta kay Jesus. Kaya nga makikita mo from plague number four, to plague number 10, na-spare na yung, yung Israelites. They did not go through the seven plagues. Yun na yung seven na itinago na sila doon sa tabernacle ni God, na tabernacle number one. Yun yung doon tayo ngayon paakyat sa tabernacle number one. Pero iisa-isahin natin ang paakyat. Sila inakyat na lang doon. Yung judgment was on Egypt. Yan yung tatanggapin natin kung hindi tayo aalis ng Egypt. Pero yung mga Israelites na kasakay on Eagle's Wings, napunta yung judgment sa Trinity, kaya sila nakapasok doon sa tabernacle number one. Ngayon, ang kaparalel sa New, you know, the finger of God has a counterpart in the New. In John chapter 8, verses 6, at saka on 8, remember the adulterous woman? When... They brought an adulterous woman to Jesus and they said, this woman was caught in adultery. Are we supposed to stone him? And then in verse 6, this they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus took down and wrote on the ground with his finger. What is this telling us? That that woman was supposed to be stoned to death to receive his judgment, just like what happened to the Egyptians. But when Jesus wrote on the ground with his finger, he was saying to the adulterous woman, I will be the one to prepare the ground for you. I will be the one to get your judgment for in your place on the ground. That is when the body of Jesus burned on the ground for three days. In verse 8, and then again, he took down and wrote on the ground. The second time Jesus wrote on the ground was now the new covenant where Jesus now wrote the law in the heart of adulterous woman. That's why the adulterous woman is forgiven. And Jesus says, go and sin no more. Because the law was already written, the heart of the adulterous woman. Okay, after the judgment of the Trinity comes the restoration. It is now the Trinity who is going to indwell the tabernacle number one, which is our hearts. So makikita natin ang picture in the old, we see a picture in the new, and then even in Luke chapter 11, 20, ano sabi niya? But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, so you see, when God put his finger on Jesus, meaning he put his judgment on Jesus, on his crucifixion, what happened? That was when Satan was decapitated. Natanggalan na ng authority si Satan. So that was when the judgment of God was on Jesus. That was the finger of God na si Satan wala ng authority over us. Kaya nga sabi niya, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Can you imagine when the finger of God was, or the judgment was put on Jesus, that was the beginning of the setting of the kingdom of God in our hearts. The second set of tablets is parallel to the new covenant when God would now write his laws in our hearts. So in Deuteronomy 10 verses 1 and 2, at that time the Lord said to me, 
Hew for yourself two tablets of stones, like the first, and come to me on the mountain, and make yourself an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. Ito na yung restoration. The second set of tablets is a picture of God writing His law in our hearts, meaning the Trinity indwelling our hearts, so that now we can obey God. And for them in the Old Testament, this was the monergistic fulfillment of the fourth covenant. And then in Jeremiah 31, verses 33 to 34, this is the equivalent of the new covenant counterpart of ours in Hebrews 8, verses 7 to 10. Magkapareho yan. Ito yung sabi niya. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them in their hearts and be their God and they shall be my people. So it is only when God's laws are in our hearts that God is now our God. With our old heart, yung unang ten tablets of stone na binasag niya, that was a picture of the old heart where Satan is still the ruler of the heart. Nung nabasag yun, we now are given a new heart where God can now write His laws in our hearts. The God of heaven can now be our God. So unless the old heart is broken, God cannot be our God. And He cannot write His laws in our hearts. Okay, so basahin na lang ninyo yung Hebrews 8 verses 7 to 10. That is the counterpart of our new covenant. And in Deuteronomy 9 verse 26, it says, Therefore, I prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord God, do not destroy your people and your inheritance whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. You see there the hand? Dito, you will see that it was Moses who interceded for the Father because God was about to kill the Israelites when they were in the wilderness. They were still complaining. They were already murmuring. God was already carrying them. They still, you know, kept complaining. So God wanted to kill them at that point. But Jesus interceded for them, prostrated himself, and actually he said, you know, Father God, you just bring the judgment upon me. You just kill me, but spare them, he said. And he says, but Pharaoh will not heed you so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Dito you will see the hand, you will see the finger, the hand, and the arm. It's already labeled there, okay? And in Exodus 9 verse 15, it says, Now if I had stretched out my hand, that's the arm, okay, and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. That is the judgment that state was absorbed by the Trinity that spared the Israelites. And then in Exodus 7 verse 8, But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep an oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Dito naman, makikita mo na yung restoration. Yung una, yung judgment. Judgment that was put on the Trinity and with that is restoration. And so, you see there how God shows us in picture language how he was able to do it. Because of God's mighty hand, what happened? He divided the Red Sea so that the Egyptians drowned in the Red Sea, but God's mighty hand divided the Red Sea so that they were able to cross the Red Sea on eagle's wings. They were able to transfer to the wilderness. And in Exodus 13, verse 3, 7, and Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by the strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. The hand is the work of the Holy Spirit because it is the Holy Spirit who divided the waters so that he will transfer them from darkness, which is Egypt, to lead them to the wilderness, which is light. So that was the hand of God. 
work of the Holy Spirit. Exodus 6 verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of this land. Even Pharaoh knew that when the judgment for sin was done, na si Jesus took it, wala nang authority si Pharaoh, so he, he let the Israelites go. So that's the picture language that God is showing us how nakatago yung finger niya, yung hand, at saka yung arm. Pero may dichotomy, yung isa judgment, yung isa restoration. Okay? And then, this is all about the outstretched arm now, because it's now the Father's work. Therefore, say to the children of Israel, as we are in Exodus 6, verse 6, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. So God put judgments on his Egypt, but he put, deliverance on the Israelites with an outstretched arm, meaning the finished work of the cross was the one that set us free. And in Deuteronomy 9 verse 29, it says, Yet they are your people and your inheritance whom you brought out by your mighty power and by your outstretched arm. So that's our deliverance and restoration. And in Exodus 3 verse 20, sabi niya, And so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, he will let you go. So you see, the only way Pharaoh will let us go is when the judgment for our sin was taken by the Trinity. And so that is called the preparation. Yun yung, yung, unang, yung unang finger, hand, and arm was the preparation of the heart. It's the work of the Trinity. And this is the summary. Finger is our judgment, our uh, earned our justification. The mighty hand was leaving Egypt. It's parallel to the demolition of the heart, which is our sanctification. And the outstretched arm is the indwelling of the Trinity. And that is our restoration, it's parallel to glorification. And in Deuteronomy 9, verses 25 to 29, this is just when it was Jesus who took our place. Makikita mo, Jesus interceded for us. Sabi niya, uh, Thus I prostrated myself before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. kept prostrating myself because the Lord had said that he would destroy you. Therefore, I prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord God, I do not destroy your people and your inheritance from the redeemed through your greatness whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not look on the stubbornness of these people or on their wickedness or on their sin. So in other words, you just read that. In short, this was Moses interceding on behalf of the people. You know, it's parallel to Jesus interceding for us. Okay, and in Deuteronomy 10, verses 1 to 3, this is when uh, God ordered Moses to uh, bring the second two sets of tablets. What I just wanted to show you here was that, where was this? It was on the mountain. Sabi niya, come up to me. He says there, I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. You and your ark. So he said, verse 3, So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up to the mountain, having the two tablets in my hand. So where was that? In the mountain. So makikita mo, Moses was definitely sent by God because he was able to bring the Israelites to the mountain. That proves the Exodus 3.12 where it says, Karina, we started with Exodus 3.12 where he says, I will certainly be with you and this will be a sign to you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You will serve God on the mountain. So just like Moses, the true messenger of God will definitely be able to get in the mountain of God first and bring all the people that God will send him to also to the tabernacle number one, which is the mountain of God.
and with that we end. We end, we finish covenant number four. Covenant.